So now we are speaking with Dr. Ben Brown, who is an assistant professor and researcher at CU Boulder. He studies fluid dynamics in stars and exoplanet atmospheres. He uses supercomputer modeling techniques to understand convection inside of stars and how it builds and affects the sun's active magnetic field. This can help us learn more about the origins of magnetic field events like solar flares that could impact life on or near Earth. So thank you very much for joining us. Glad to be here. So we're going to jump right in and ask you probably the easy question. So fundamentally, you study how fluid dynamics kind of helps generate magnetic fields inside of stars and planets. Can you give us kind of a high level intro on how that works? Yeah. So um, in, uh, in both our Earth and the Sun, which is the star I study the most, though I like other ones as well, um, there are large-scale motions in the interior of the objects. Um, in the Earth, we have large-scale motions in the core of the Earth and also in our atmosphere. Um, and both of those sets of motions actually share similarities to similar motions inside the Sun. And we study all of these together um, because they all have fluid dynamical properties and do some similar things, and we try and learn from all of them. So in these... In these systems, especially in the core of the Earth and in the Sun, um, you can kind of think of both of those round spherical objects as having a hot thing in the middle, a source of heat at the center. Um, and that source of heat, as, it, as the heat comes out through the outer layers of the fluid object, it can drive that fluid into large scale motions. Um, we call those large-scale motions driven by heat and buoyancy convection, and they're a bit like what you get when you start boiling a pot of water on the stove, just a bit before you start getting the bubbles of the boiling, which is like the water turning into gas phase and going up. Before that, you can actually see the water in your pot of water starting to do stuff like this. You're looking from above and seeing it like this, and you can see it doing motions. That's convection where the hot water at the bottom is rising up and the cool water at the top is falling down. And I've seen videos, in fact, of people, like accomplished chefs, it seems, who can make their pasta, they sustain that convection as they cook it. So it stirs the pasta for them because it kind of just follows the water. And so that's kind of a cool thing to like visualize and see directly what this convection current is doing. So. Convection loves making um, patterns too. So um, when you're doing it in like a pan, like so especially a shallow pan with a little bit of oil in it, you can get it that sometimes make little hexagons. It looks like a honeycomb pattern across it, um, which is, is pretty cool. In a, in a big pot of pasta, um, you tend to get one big cell that goes from the bottom to the top. Um, Unless you stir it. If you stir it, it gets more complicated because then you technically have made the water rotate and rotating convection is super cool and very dominant in both the sun and the earth. Um, in, uh, in the sun, um, that we have this new telescope called the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, DKIST for short, on Haleakala. And um, they had some publicity um, image, press release images uh, earlier this year. And if you look at the pictures in the sun, when they really, like, really zoom in on the full resolution of this thing, you see these little like side-by-side -side patches that are kind of like hexagons too. And that's actually convection at the surface of the sun that we're looking down on top of. And we're seeing it as it boils up to the surface of the sun. So you're the viewer and I'm the center of the sun and the motions are coming up and they're, they're very small scale at the very surface. And the deeper you go in the sun, we think the bigger the scale of the motions becomes. Um, so at the surface, those scales of motion, they're still big for Earth sizes. So those individual spots, those individual um, convective patterns on the surface, we call them granules or granulation, they're like the size of either France or Texas, roughly, in size. So each little like blob is like a Texas or a France. Um, we, use, we use Texas for American audiences and France when we're giving talks in Europe, of course. Um, as you, go, as you go deeper in the sun, we think that those same convective motions get bigger and bigger and bigger in scale. Um, it has to do with the fact that the sun, like our Earth's atmosphere, is um, stratified in density. So it's very dense at the bottom and less dense at the top. So kind of like in Boulder, we know the air is thinner. 
because Boulder is at 5,000 feet, and so the air is about 80% the density of sea level. Um, and if you keep going up in the Earth's atmosphere, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, same thing happens in the sun. It's, in a sense, very thin near the top, near what we call the photosphere, where we see kind of the, the surface of the sun. Um, and as, if you went deeper in the sun, the density actually gets um, larger and larger and larger. So what is it about the convection that helps generate that magnetic field? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And one we don't really know all the answers to, but I'll tell you a little bit. So, um, so we think that the magnetic field in the core of the earth, the one that gives us the North Pole and South Pole for our compasses to find, um, and the magnetic field generated inside the sun that shows up both as sunspots on the surface that we can see, and also as a large scale north field, south field, um, like on the earth that we can measure effectively with compasses in space on satellites and other things. Um, we, and also remotely from um, polarization of light from telescope uh, observations of the sun. Um, we think that both of those magnetic fields um, have to be um, maintained by a physical process. Okay, so why do we think that? So the center of the earth is very hot. It's, um, uh, if I'm getting my numbers right, I think it's like 5,000 Kelvin or so. Um, it's about the same temperature at the center of the earth as on the surface of the sun, about 5,000, 6,000 Kelvin on the surface of the sun. And the center of the sun's even hotter, about uh, 15 million Kelvin. Ish. And Kelvin, Celsius, they kind of count the same, right? But zero Kelvin's like absolute zero cold as it gets. Um, zero Celsius is actually at like 273 Kelvin. And from there on, they just uh, degree Celsius and a degree Kelvin's the same thing. But on the other hand, like 6,000 is hot in whatever degrees you're in, and 15 million is even hotter. Um, all of those temperatures are well above what we call the Curie point of any normal material. So the Curie point is where like a magnet on a fridge um, goes from being a magnet to being a lump of iron. So if you take a magnet from a fridge and you put it in a frying pan and you heat it up, at some point it stops being a magnet. It does that not at incredible temperatures. And the center of the sun and the surface of the sun, and the center of the earth, they are incredible temperatures. Um, so, so the sun and the earth don't have like little like iron bar magnets all lined up to give it a large scale field. So it's got to be something else. Um, and what we've come to realize over um, sort of decades of study is that it's what we call a dynamo process. So it's a process where fluid motions, kinetic energy of fluid motion, um, create magnetic energy and large scale organized magnetic fields. Um, how that happens exactly, we understand bits of, but not everything of. So there is, um, for just like the fundamental idea of how a dynamo process works, the magnetic fields um, are almost a little bit like rubber bands in when they're inside a charged fluid, um, a conducting fluid. So the, the liquid iron of the Earth's core or the... Um, hot plasma, the hot hydrogen helium plasma of the sun. Um, those are very conducting materials and fluids. And when those materials have magnetic fields in them, as the fluid moves, any magnetic field kind of acts as a rubber band in that fluid. And it, gets, it can be stretched, which kind of makes it stronger, puts energy into the magnetic field, much like when you take a rubber band and you stretch it, you're putting tension into it. And you can also sort of take that rubber band, you can stretch it, and then you can fold it on itself, and then you can stretch it again and fold that on itself. And if you have these sort of stretching and folding motions, you can take um, a weak magnetic field and turn it into a very strong magnetic field. Um, it's almost like making like layers of pastry or something like that, like making a, a croissant of magnetic field. You're like rolling it out and folding it over and rolling it out over and getting layers built up make a nice flaky magnetic field. Um, I think so, these discussions of solar physics have led to the best kind of personifications of like physical processes. We've heard so many in the past week, like what, different ways to describe all of this. I love there that. There you go. A nice flaky magnetic field. That's uh, delicious. 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 Um, so, describing a magnetic field. Okay, so, so there's 
a small part of the answer. So, so you can, if you have conducting fluid in motion, you can, um, you can strengthen a magnetic field. If you have some sort of like stretching and folding and then stretching and folding kind of process. Um, the folding's important because otherwise you just like stretch it and then unstretch it later on. And you want to like, you want to keep stretching it. So the, the mechanism for that is to stretch and then fold. Okay. Um, why is convection, why is convection do anything? So convection, um, convection is a very useful way for there to be kinetic energy in the fluid motion. You need the fluid in motion, you need it stirred, and convection is a way of, in a sense, stirring the fluid. So what's convection? Convection, in some senses, is the conversion of thermal energy or potential energy into fluid kinetic energy. So we've got this kind of like, I think of it almost like a machine or an engine, right? You've got like a, you've got like a thermal energy source, and that is like driving a convection engine. And the convection engine is like stretching and amplifying the magnetic field. Um, things, especially in the sun and the earth too, get more complicated. That, um, that convection, um, in addition to making the magnetic field, it does some other things. Um, so one thing that it does is it makes the sun rotate in some very interesting ways. Um, our sun has what's called a differential rotation. What that means is that if you look at the equator of the sun and you look at the pole of the sun on the surface and you count how long it takes for a thing to go all the way around. Um, so we do this by measuring the plasma velocities. We also do it by watching like sunspots moving and we watch like convective features moving. We watch lots of things moving because there's no like real fixed surface. So we can't just look for like, hey, when does Africa rotate around on the earth, right? Or something, we have to like, we have to try and the measurement's a little hard on the sun, but we have a lot of different ways of measuring it. And they all kind of say the same thing, including some really cool ones that I'll tell you about in a few minutes um, about how we measure actually the inside of the sun where we can't see. So when we measure all of these, what we see is that the equator goes around faster in even um, uh, how many days does it take sense, not even just a like miles per hour sense. The equator goes around faster than the poles. Okay, so when we look at the Earth and a solid thing, right, we look at the equator and we're like, okay, um, Africa, South America, they take one day to go around the Earth. Okay, sweet. Okay, let's look, um, let's look, uh, let's look south. Let's go look at like southern Chile or like Australia. Okay, that takes one day to go around the Earth. Okay, good. Okay, really extreme. Let's look at Antarctica. Okay, Antarctica takes one day to go around the Earth. We look at the sun and we look at the equator. And the equator takes like 25 days, 25 Earth days to go one lap around the sun. 25 Earth days at the equator. Now we go look at like the pole and it takes like 35 Earth days to go around. So the, the sun, right, the equator is going around and the pole is going around, but there's this like big stirring shear on the large scale call that the differential rotation of the sun. And we think that that is built by the same small scale convective motions. We think that they actually build that large scale difference in rotation. Um, we don't really understand how even that happens in detail. Um, that seems to be uh, especially an interaction of both the stratification of the sun. So that means that dense, deep, uh, low density, high up, so that's a stratification um, combined with the fact that the sun is a, a rotating body. Those two things together um, seem to um, contribute together to the creation of the differential rotation. Okay, that large scale differential rotation, that um, big like wind in a sense where the equator goes fast and the poles go slow, um, that plays a big role in the dynamo amplification of magnetic field. Because if I now take a magnetic field that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole, there's my magnetic field, and I'm, I'm shearing it like this, I'm stretching that field and making it stronger. And um, the kind of funny thing is if you've got a field going this way and a flow going this way, the field going this way, the kind of field the flow makes, it's actually in the direction of the flow. 
And that field is the same orientation as the field that we see in sunspots. Okay, what's a sunspot? Sunspots are these regions of super strong magnetic field. We see right up at the surface of the sun. They tend to be nice. They tend to be round. They tend to be about the size of the earth, which is kind of cool. Um, and they've got like, if I'm remembering right, they've got field strengths of like two kilogauss, which is bunches and bunches. The average magnetic field strength on the surface of the sun is I think like a gauss. That may also be the same as the average magnetic field strength here on the earth, but I'm not actually sure. Ask someone who actually knows. Maybe like sunspots, super strong magnetic field. And they have magnetic fields that, um, that connect between pairs of sunspots in particular ways. They follow all sorts of rules. And we've been fascinated with them for 400 years, ever since Galileo saw them. Um, and we've wondered like, what are they? Where do they come from? Um, what's the story? Um, we know now because we can now, so Galileo observed them and did these just beautiful sketches. Um, Rice University has actually digitized some of his sketches and you can see Galileo's original hand-drawn sketches. They're basically equivalent in quality to the observations that we could do of the sun up until like the 1950s. Um, and the big change in the 1950s is that we figured out like digital measurements and cameras basically. Um, like they're, it's an amazing data set. Um, people wondered for a very long time what they were. Um, we learned that there are magnetic fields when we learned how to take their light and split it apart and look at the colors of light and measure the spectra. And we could see that there was a, a spreading of the colors in those sunspots that's what's called Zeeman splitting. Um, the interaction of a magnetic field with um, certain, um, certain electronic configurations of atoms and molecules. So we could actually see that it was magnetic field and even measure its strength remotely using telescopes. Um, so we, we know what they are now and we've learned all sorts of things about them. We still don't really know where they come from. We know they come from inside. Um, they show patterns that also follow the patterns of the north-south field of the sun. So you may know that the earth, the north pole and the south pole magnetically sometimes change around. Um, we see this in like magnetic sediments on the Atlantic seafloor and we can measure like 200 million years of the Earth's history of the magnetic field flipping on the Earth, we call it, where like sometimes the North rotational pole is the South magnetic pole. It's still in the same physical spot. It's still pointing at the same stars on the sky, but the magnetic polarity up there has changed. Um, on the Earth, that takes a long time and kind of a hard to predict time. Sometimes it's millions of years, sometimes it's tens of thousands of years. It's um, extremely variable. Um, the sun does the same thing. The sun, uh, its, its north rotational pole is always pointing at the same spot because it's very big and spinning and conserving angular momentum. Um, but its north magnetic pole um, sometimes is at the south rotating pole and its south magnetic pole is at the north rotating pole and they flip back and forth and they actually flip extremely regularly compared to the Earth's pole. Um, they flip about every 11 years in something we call the solar cycle. And there's also an 11 year sunspot cycle. So the sunspots and the flipping magnetic field seem to have some deep relationship. What we don't know is, is that um, do the sunspots cause the magnetic field flip? Do the sunspots just show us a proxy, some information about the magnetic field flip, like what all is going on. We've been debating that more or less since we ever knew the magnetic field was flipping on the sun. And there are different, there are different stories and theories about how it works. Some are very sunspot centric and say that like the sunspot is like the structure that then creates everything else. Um, and some are, are very different and say, look, the sunspot's just a manifestation of a deeper underlying phenomena going on. Um, I fall in the second camp. Um, the sunspots are just uh, a feature. They're just something we're seeing that's doing the same thing as sort of deeper stuff. Um, but many other people in Boulder um, follow more of a, the sunspot is the structure, it is the driver. Um, in uh, And so, so 
why do we care about any of this, you might ask? Um, it's cool. It's neat to learn about our sun. Sunspots are pretty. It's fun to try and figure them out. Um, the solar cycle and sunspots have some direct impacts on our technological society where like they actually can affect daily life on the surface of the earth. Uh, it makes the sun one of the few astronomical objects you can study that has an unambiguous um, importance to most people on the earth most of the time, other than just the fact that like it's in our sky and gives us all of our heat and warmth. Um, so sunspots, uh, sunspots occasionally have gigantic storms that come out of them. Um, these are called uh, solar flares and coronal mass ejections. These are two different things, um, but they, uh, they seem to come out of the sunspots and their frequency and severity um, goes in, in a pattern that has a relationship to the solar cycle that we see. So there's times when they're very extreme and there are times when they're less extreme. It's almost a little bit like the hurricane season on earth, right? There's, there's times when you know that like the Southeast is gonna get hit by hurricanes um, and there are times of the year where you don't worry about it nearly as much. Um, the sun and its CMEs and its flares, um, the solar cycle is kind of the hurricane season in some ways. And you could think of the flares and CMEs as almost like hurricanes coming from the sun and hitting the earth. Okay, I'm a professor, so I talk a lot and I've talked a lot. So um, let me stop talking so you can actually ask some questions. There, it's almost as if solar physics is its own field of science and that there's just so much to learn about and unpack that, that we, you know, this could be like a lecture. That one question could lead to like probably a week's worth of content in an undergrad course. So, so probably. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Wow. Um, there was a lot to unpack there and I have a lot of questions, but I have to stop because we, we have to move through these. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep going here. Um, so, so we just talked about how convection and the solar dynamo, uh, we you know, are involved in the in the generation of the magnetic field on the sun. Are there other ways that we see uh, magnetic fields being generated in astronomical objects, or is this fluid dynamical process really what the, is at the core of all of these magnetic fields? That's a really good question. Um, so, to some extent, fluid dynamics. In my biased view, as someone who really likes fluid dynamics, to some extent, fluid dynamics um, is behind all magnetic fields we see in all astrophysical objects. I'm probably wrong somewhere, uh, but by and large, that's true. Um, so um, most astrophysical objects that we see magnetic fields in for a sustained period of time um, seem to be doing dynamos. All right, so we have to be a little careful. So, um, so um, stars on the lower main sequence and planets, usually if they have magnetic fields, are showing us that they either have a dynamo now or had one in the past. Um, so, um, so like, uh, let's stick to planets for a minute. Um, so, Jupiter, strong magnetic field, we think it's running a dynamo. Um, Saturn, strong magnetic field, we think it's running a dynamo. Uranus and Neptune, strong magnetic fields running dynamos, as far as we can understand. Earth, strong magnetic field running a dynamo. Mars, um, weak magnetic field with lots of structure that is observed in its surface. Okay, that seems to be what's called a crustal field, a frozen in magnetic field from when Mars had a dynamo in the past. We think Mars does not have a dynamo now. Its magnetic field is pretty weak. Um, magnetic fields on the planets with dynamos, in some sense, they tend to have like a, a big organization, like a North Pole, a South Pole field that goes from one to the other. Mars, it has more like hair. It's got like, uh, it's got like little loops kind of all over the place and less large scale organization. Um, so we think that Mars's magnetic field we see now is not from a dynamo right now. But we think there was one in the past. And we think that Mars lost the convection that drives the engine to make the kinetic energy to run the dynamo. And so what we're seeing now on Mars is kind of like the memory, the memory of Mars past and the magnetic field it used to generate. 
Okay. Um, lots of stars have magnetic fields. Um, the ones that are in the lower main sequence, the ones that are kind of like our sun, those all seem to, we're pretty sure those are dynamo generated. There are stars more massive than the sun, much bigger. So by more massive, I mean they weigh, they have more material mass than the sun. Um, like we're, we're talking two to five to 10 to a hundred times the mass of the sun. Um, those stars have all sorts of other cool, crazy things about them. The big ones are a million times brighter. We call them the O stars and the B stars are some of the brightest stars in the sky. Um, some of those have what we call fossil magnetic fields. They seem to have magnetic fields on their surface that no one's really sure quite where they come from. And they don't seem to change in some of the ways that stars like the sun's magnetic fields do. So some of those stars, we have some observations of their fields that span decades to maybe even centuries, often through proxies, where the field seems to be the same all that time. We call those fossil fields, and we think they come from a they may be a bit like the fossil fields of Mars. They may reflect a time when the star had a dynamo in the past in those regions, and now we have kind of the memory of it. Um, but even those stars, they have convection deep in their core in their very centers, and we think that they're actually running dynamos in their cores. So even they, even they have dynamo-generated fields. Um, OK, who doesn't have dynamo-generated fields? Um, neutron stars um, and white dwarfs they seem to have fossil fields that are not currently dynamo generated. They probably also came from a dynamo in the past. Um, they, they either came from a dynamo in the past um, or the other way that you can strengthen magnetic field, that's kind of a cool way, is if you have a bunch of magnet, you have, if you have magnetic field that's pretty weak but fills a really big volume. If you take that magnetic field and you compress it into a really, 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 really tiny volume, then the magnetic field gets very, very, very strong. So if you have a lot of like really spread out stuff and you like squeeze it all down into a little tiny ball and it was a conducting material, so it brought the magnetic field with it when it was being swept in, then even though it's not doing like this stretchy foldy dynamo stuff, just the squeezing it together amplifies the magnetic field. Okay. Um, we see this during the formation of stars. We take a lot of stuff that's spread out by a long distance and we like a parsec or so, the size of a like molecular gas cloud, and we squeeze it down into like a star. Um, that is a huge compression and a huge amplification of magnetic field. So that, that is a mechanism for taking weak field and amplifying it and organizing it. Um, and when you take a star that's big and a massive star and it's starting supernova, and the middle of it squeezes down into a neutron star. And we go from a star that's like several times the size of the sun. And we squeeze it down into a neutron star that's like the size of Boulder, Colorado. Um, that is a lot of squishing and compression. And that also would take a maybe diffuse magnetic field from the dynamo of the pre-supernova star and squeeze it into an incredibly strong magnetic field in the neutron star. Um, the other spot where things get hard is magnetic fields of galaxies. Um, galaxies have organized magnetic fields. Um, those may or may not come from dynamo processes. Um, the problem there is that in the sun, the stretchy foldy thing probably happens on timescales of months, maybe years. The sun is like five billion years old. There are a lot of months in five billion years broadly, but even a lot of years and 5 billion years. So there's lots of times to like stretch things and fold them and stretch them and fold them. Galaxies, like the rotation time in our galaxy at the sun's location in the disk of the galaxy is I think like 200 million years. There are not that many 200 million years even in the like 12 billion years of our galaxy, broadly, right? Like now we're talking like tens to hundreds rather than billions and billions. And like tens to hundreds might not be enough for galaxies. Um, that, that gets hard to do a dynamo on those kinds of time scales. It, it's not impossible, but there's like some real debate about how you do it. Um, the other thing that gets really crazy is like all of these things I've told you about, about dynamos, they, they assume you have some magnetic field around to do the stretching and folding and other stuff too. Um, 
when you form the sun out of material and the galaxy, which itself is magnetized, no problem. You have a little bit of magnetic field. Same with the earth. You form the earth from the material around the sun that's magnetized, fine. Where do you get the first magnetic fields from? In the very beginning of time and like the big bang plasma before you've done any of this stuff. Um, plasma physicists have some answers to those things from like super cool plasma effects. There's a thing called a Beerman battery that can operate and other stuff like that. And there, there's some ways of making that like very first bit of magnetic field so you can stretch it. But to some extent, my bias point of view from that point on, it's all fluid dynamics and dynamo physics. So. So we're talking a lot about all of this stuff that happens like in the center of things like stars. Um, I know we can see some of that convection happening like on the surface, but how do we actually study the inside of the star? That's a cool question. Um, so Sir Arthur Eddington was a super famous astronomer back in the early 1900s. Um, we have various things named after him. He was a British scientist, very well respected in his field. And at one point he said, you know, the one place we will never be able to, I'm going to paraphrase his quote. There's a great quote to go looking for. He, but to paraphrase it, he basically said like the one spot in the universe we're never going to get to see is inside a star like the sun. It's going to be forever hidden from our view. No chance of seeing it. I think that quote was from the 1920s, broadly speaking. Um, by the 1990s, we could see inside the sun in detail. And in fact, we have made measurements of the inside of the sun that are accurate to less than a percent of uncertainty, which in astronomy and astrophysics is like practically unheard of before we started doing like CMB astrophysics and other things like that. Like a lot of our measurements in astronomy and astrophysics were like, it's in the ballpark. And like we, we make many, many, many of those measurements to give us um, scientific um, certainty. But a lot of times, if we're frank, as astronomers, we're not doing science at, in the same kind of uncertainty range as like physicists doing like particle physics, where it's like five sigma events, which means that like, you know, the uncertainties and your result is accurate out to like fractions of a percent. Usually we're not doing that in astronomy and astrophysics. We call ourselves often a one sigma science when we're being honest about things. Right, and like that means we're more likely to be wrong, uh, but we can still learn a lot of things. And we, we keep trying to build up our chains of logic and improving our measurements. In the sun, for some of our measurements, we're in a three to five sigma science range where we have measurements that are better than a percent. Measurements of the interior properties of the sun. Um, how do we do that? Um, so uh, there are kind of two different ways that I know of that we can see inside the sun. I'm going to tell you the really exotic one, and then I'm going to tell you the really simple one, which actually we learn a lot more from. So the really exotic one is, um, so the problem with the sun and seeing inside of it is that the surface of the sun is opaque. So the surface of the sun, what we call the photosphere. The photosphere is the surface that light comes out of the sun. That's basically where you go from the sun being opaque below that level to being transparent above that level. Um, so we see the photosphere, so we see the like last, the last opaque surface before it becomes transparent. Everything deeper in the sun, if I'm the center and you're the viewer and you're seeing my photosphere, if you see my hands as the photosphere, you can't see my face because it's buried under my hands and my hands are opaque. So if my head's the core and my hands are the surface, you can't see what's going on in the center of the sun. Man, it'd be really neat if there's some way of detecting some kind of radiation or something that came out of the center of the sun that would like thought the sun was transparent um, there's a type of radiation that comes out of the center of the sun that, uh, that, that the sun is transparent to. And in fact, we're transparent to too, and it's flying through us right now and through the earth we're sitting under and pretty much all material known to man. Um, it's a type of radiation called neutrino radiation. So we often talk about like radiation coming from the sun as photons, that's electromagnetic radiation. Um, neutrinos are a, um, a weakly interacting particle. Weakly there means in like the physics sense of weak. So like they interact with what's called the weak force. So I said photons are electromagnetism. They use the electromagnetic force. These 
weird neutrinos use something called the weak force and they're extremely different from almost everything else we have experienced with in this world. Um, but like a hundred billion of them are going through my thumbnail every second while I'm talking with you and the same for you. Um, because almost all material in the universe is transparent to them. Um, if you're super clever and you get a lot of material all together in one spot, then you can detect um, the occasional neutrino out of this incredible flux of them that are coming through you all the time. Um, we have a couple ways of doing that. Um, one of them is to build giant tanks of water, usually under mountains. So a very famous one in Japan is called Super Kamiokande. It's a giant, giant tank of water, um, like just huge, absolutely huge. Um, you can go boating on it and your rowboat is small compared to the overall tank. And they use this tank and they, they have instruments all around this tank that look inside this tank and look for minute flashes of light that happen when one of these neutrinos flies through this tank. So they're, they're just trillions and trillions flying through the tank. But every now and then, one of these neutrinos out of like the just trillions on trillions on trillions, every now and then one of them bumps into an electron through the weak force and sends the electron flying through the water super, super, super fast. And that makes the electron emit a very characteristic blue light, uh, kind of a Sherenkov radiation blue light. It's like the, the sonic boom of the electron moving through the water in light. Um, and you can see that and you can infer there was a neutrino and you can measure the neutrino. Crazy. We do an even crazier version of this where we want even more water. So we use the um, Antarctic ice um, and you drill into the Antarctic ice and your little detectors spread out on the Antarctic ice. It's a huge detector called Ice Cube. It's run partly out of U University of Wisconsin, Madison, where I spent a couple years as a postdoc. It's just, it's crazy and it all works. And when you do crazy things like that, you can see these crazy things called neutrinos. And you can actually take a picture of the core of the sun in neutrinos. And those can actually let you measure how fast nuclear reactions are happening in the core of the sun. Whoa. That's crazy. <laughs> you can measure them so well that we actually found out that our understanding of particle physics was wrong. And that neutrinos do this crazy thing that no one ever predicted they would do called neutrino flavor oscillations where the neutrino that's created in the center of the sun, it's called an electron neutrino typically, and it can change into one of two other flavors, a muon or tau neutrino as it's traveling through space and matter and stuff. And like, so what started is like one kind of neutrino when it gets to us is a mixture of neutrinos. And for a long time in the, uh, especially early um, 70s, 80s and 90s, this was called the solar neutrino paradox. And um, particle physics said, we predict this, solar physics said, we see this and predict this based on our models of the sun. And particle physics said, you're wrong. Your models of the sun must be wrong because they're very complicated. Or these measurements you're doing must be wrong because they're very hard to do. And people worked really hard on those. So it turned out particle physics was wrong, which never happens, right? Like basically never happens and, um, and did in this case. How do we know those models are right though? That's this other measurement we can do of the sun that I want to tell you about. The simpler measurement that I think is in many ways way more interesting. Um, okay, so we could use like crazy nuclear physics to like observe the absolute core of the sun from the neutrinos that are flying out of it that think everything's transparent in the universe practically. Okay, what's our other way of measuring things? Um, so the other thing that can travel through the sun and all fluids, um, is something that I'm using to talk to you right now. Right? The air between us is, um, is transparent to light, but it also um, it conducts another kind of wave through it. It conducts sound waves from my mouth to my microphone, which are then being sent electronically, and then they're coming out of the speakers that you're listening to. Um, sound waves can travel through fluids really well. We're actually, you, know, you may not think of it this way if you're not a fluid dynamicist, but you are actually sitting in a fluid right now. It's all around you. The air of our atmosphere is a fluid. And anytime you're in a fluid, like I'm swimming, I'm just very heavy compared to the air. So I sink and I'm at the bottom of the swimming pool, basically of air rising above me. Um, but I can send sound waves through this fluid. Um, and sometimes another wave called an internal gravity wave, but especially acoustic waves, sound waves through this fluid. Um, and those sound waves can travel through this fluid. 
So the sun can actually have sound waves traveling through it. And if we look at the surface of the sun at this opaque photosphere, so again, like I am the core of the sun, my hands are the photosphere here, and we can see the photosphere of the sun. We can't see inside, but we can see this photosphere. And when we look at the photosphere, what we actually see is this. We don't see the photosphere just sitting here, stable, quiet, and static. We see it actually rippling continuously. Okay, how do we measure that? Um, we use Doppler techniques. So we, we look at the light coming from the sun. We see the colors of the light. And when the ripple comes towards us, it, the light becomes a little tiny bit blue. And when the ripple goes away from us, the light becomes a little a bit, tiny bit red. We call that a Doppler shift. And when my hands go back and forth like this, it's blue here and then blue here and blue here and blue here. And we can see those little itty bitty tiny color shifts in the light. And we can measure those incredibly sensitively. And so we can see incredibly tiny wiggles all over the surface of the sun. We can measure those um, spatially over the surface of the sun too. So we can see a wiggle here versus a wiggle here. When we do that, just looking at the sun at any given time, we see like 4 million different distinct wiggles-ish, maybe even somewhere in that ballpark, millions of distinct wiggles. These distinct wiggles are sound waves inside the sun, traveling inside the sun and bouncing off of the surface. Okay, what we see is a mess. It's all the wiggles all at once. Um, Oh my God, what are we gonna do? Um, what you do is you call some very, very, very smart scientists in a field that's worked on this for years. So there's another celestial object where we see wiggles on the surface that we use to learn about the interior. That is our earth. The wiggles are earthquakes. The science is seismology. So a large collaboration began in the um, 80s and 90s, as we started realizing these wiggles were happening, as we learned how to measure them as we launched. Um, so you can measure them from Earth. From, measuring from Earth is super hard because the sun is only in the sky for you know eight or so hours a day. Clouds get in your way. Um, these wiggles, it turns out, have a characteristic time scale of five minutes. So you can see the wiggles happening on a five minute time scale but you might want to measure them for a long time because the longer you can measure, the better your signal gets and the, the kind of more frequencies you can measure. Um, the characteristic of any time you're measuring time varying signals. Um, that's hard to do on the earth. So people would do things like go to the South Pole to, Austri or to Antarctica in the summer to try and get more time when the sun is up in the sky to get measurements. That's hard. Like going to the South Pole is hard, 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 hard. That was kind of enough to like get kind of the first data to really learn about this. Um, really breaking through this took um, launches of satellites into space that did this in a dedicated way. So in the 90s, we launched something called the MDI experiment, the Michelson Doppler interferometer on the SOHO spacecraft, which was a workhorse, billion dollar class, Hubble telescope class telescope that we launched to observe the sun. Uh, we launched another one about two decades later called SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which has one of these instruments too, HMI, the Helioseismic Michelson Interferometer, I think. Okay, so once we had the data coming in, um, solar physicists started working with seismologists to figure out the math and the analysis to take this just utter mess of ripples and disentangle them and figure out like, okay, this particular wiggle, well, it, it traveled through this part of the sun and this is what it saw on its way. What are the things you can measure? Well, you can measure um, how the frequencies of the wiggle shift and you can measure, if you can disentangle all the wiggles, you can know which particular wave shape those came with. This is all linear physics. So this is stuff we're really, really, really good at doing. Um, like this is what you more or less spend all of your undergrad learning to do. And then like in graduate school, we're like, all right, like here's how to do it even more. And like linear physics, we're like, we're just super good at. Occasionally we're trying to do other problems are too hard, we come back to linear physics. Um, so, so wave physics like this, linear physics, we're like, we can, we can do super good at this when we like know where to, where to begin solving the problem. Um, when we don't, it's just a mess. But when we, when we have some guidance, we, we can do super good. So you can figure out how the frequencies shift because the wave 
Like this wiggle is traveling at a slightly different speed than this wiggle. They're both visible at the surface. Why are they traveling at slightly different speeds? Well, this wiggle went a little deeper in the sun based on its linear wave shape that it's got. And so it saw a part of the sun that was hot compared to this wiggle that stayed closer to the surface. So like, if here's my surface, one of the wiggles is like doing this, one of them's going way down deep and the sun's hot deep in and cold near the top. 15 million degrees deep in, 6,000 degrees at the top, continuous gradient in between. So the ones that are deep in see higher temperatures that shows up as faster sound speeds and slightly different frequencies. And you can actually measure the temperature of the sun in detail and with position going from the surface into the core. And that's one of these things that we can measure to like a tenth of a percent. Um, and we can actually measure it even better than that. Um, so, so doing these measurements gets a little tricky because there's the just data you straight up measure, the, the wiggles. Um, to figure out what it means in terms of the temperature in the interior, you have to also do what's called a stellar structure model. So you come over to your computer and you use your computer and you do a numerical model. So this does like lots of math and all of our best guess at simplified physics of how you build a star and do nuclear generation in its core from like its birth to the age of the sun. And that gives you a like temperature profile of the sun. You take your model, you make frequencies out of that model, and now you compare them to the frequencies observed and you say, same or different? Okay, they're gonna be different. Okay, so now you go and you try and tweak part of the physics in the model, because a lot of it is approximations, and you make your computer model a little better. And you basically drag the computer model frequencies into closer and closer agreement with the actual observed frequencies, the reality. You bring your model closer and closer to reality, and you get them pretty close, but not super close. We can get them to about a tenth of a percent close. The measurements disagree with the model at like the 10 or 30 sigma level. So the measurements are like even better. But we can get the model within like a tenth of a percent. Like 30 sigma is like, I don't even know what fraction of a percent. Like it's just crazy small. But like the error bars on the helioseismic sound speed measurements, they're like super tiny on an error plot that's like a tenth of a percent is this big and like the error bars are like this tiny. It's just amazing. Um, so that's how we have some confidence that we can measure the inside of the sun. And that's how we have some confidence that our solar models, well, the physics inside the sun is any good. That's why we have any confidence that the nuclear physics is right and that particle physics was wrong before we then found that out from other particle physics experiments. Okay, what else can we do with this? So once you've gotten the model measurements super close to those frequency measurements, now you can measure other things. So, so one way that you can have the frequencies a little bit off of each other is to have the temperature different. Okay, so we kind of figured that out. We got that like super close. But there's some remaining differences between the frequencies. How else could we be changing the wave speed? Well, one way is this Doppler shift we were talking a moment ago about light and the way that we could see the surface moving towards and away from us. And then the light coming off the photosphere is blue shifted if it's coming towards, red shifted if it's moving away. Well, if you put a sound wave through a fluid and that fluid is moving, then the sound wave also gets Doppler shifted. Um, you're probably more familiar with this in your day-to-day -day experience when the sound source moves through the fluid. So when you hear a train go by or you hear an ambulance go by or a police car boat go by and you hear the siren like go wee 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 as it goes by, it's like high frequency and then low frequency. High frequency as it comes towards you, low frequency as it turns a corner and goes away. That's a Doppler shift. The high frequency, the wee wee wee, that's the blue shift and the wee wee wee, that's the low frequency. I'm exaggerating it, but not like crazily. Um, we can actually measure how the sound waves moving through the sun were Doppler shifted by some of the convection motion that the sound wave was traveling through. So we can measure some of the solar convection inside the sun using the same helioseismology. We look at sound waves at the surface. We look at how those sound waves were changed in the interior. Now the problem gets much harder. The inversion problem gets much more complicated, but you use big computers, you can solve this kind of thing. You use supercomputers like I use for doing numerical simulations, but for doing the data analysis. And you can start answering questions like, 
what are the motions inside the sun? Um, so we can measure the differential rotation super well. We can measure that through basically the entire outer half of the sun. And we can measure the convection motions a little bit well, mostly we can measure them really well up at the surface and in the upper couple percent of the sun. So what we know about the inside of the sun, we know um, if you just care about things like what's the structure with radius? How do things change as you go from deep to the surface? We know that to like super good, like 10th of a percent accuracy basically everywhere. Uh, if you want to know things like what are the flows, if you ask a simple question like what's the really big sweeping differential rotation flow, we can answer that to like percent accuracy and like the outer half of the sun, really like really good. If you want to know things like, hey, what about the convective flows? What are they doing? We can answer that to like maybe 10% accuracy or maybe percent accuracy and like the outer percent to 2% of the sun. So under the photosphere, but not very deep under the photosphere. And there are really fundamental questions when you ask things about like, hey, so we think about the outer third of the sun as convection. So my hand here is about the, if it's the photosphere, the width of my hand is maybe like how much we can actually measure. And there are motions down here. And we would deeply like to know what is their character? What's their shape? How fast are they? And we actually, don't have reliable measurements of those that anyone believes. There are kind of two major classes of observational detections. Um, they use the same telescope, they use the same data, they use different analysis techniques, and they come up with answers that are like two orders of magnitude apart. One's an upper limit that says we don't detect it at all. The other is a confirmed detection with error bars. And they're like, the detection with error bars is here, the upper limit, so upper limit means it must be somewhere underneath me. It's like here, like two orders of magnitude in the physical quantity below the thing that claims to have error bars. Something's wrong. It's super cool. We have no idea. So there's lots of like cool bits of the sun we still are working out how to observe. It, you know, I like that it was, it was, we have this very complicated way of studying these neutrinos and you know, we can kind of take a picture of the sun, that's this whole thing. Or we can look at the sound and the way that you said it, you said, oh, well, you know, the sound, observing the sound on the surface of the sun, that's the easy, simple way. But then there's like so much that goes into it. So it almost feels like there's this reverse of roles where, you, you know, to, to study the neutrinos, that's tough. But then like you pretty much just have a picture and you can say, oh yeah, you know, and there was that thing with the, the, the even, you basically just count them, right? You don't even like, you just like, you, you're like, how many did we get? Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> with, the, with the sound waves, there's, it like totally opens this door to a ridiculous amount of questions that you can ask and, and inferences that you can make. And so it is, it's interesting how, you know, the, the, the simpler method of getting the data does not always mean that that will lead to the simpler answers. And of course, I don't think anyone's right. Really but that's just a good reminder that, you know, it, you, yeah, that's science, baby. Where do you want your complexity, right? Is it, we have to go to Antarctica and drill kilometer deep holes and right. put instruments in it that are going to survive Antarctica? Or um, do you want like, okay, we have all this data. We have to learn a lot of math and a lot of linear algebra and a lot of computing to right. even get an answer out. Right, um, right. So, well, and hey, here we are doing both of those things, so. <laughs> That's right, and and these two complementary ways of measuring things. The neat thing is, in science, we use both of those together to get a much clearer picture of what's actually happening than either one alone could see. And we have other things we bring in as well. And so the way we actually learn about the inside of the sun is we bring many insights from many different approaches of trying to measure it or predict it or understand it. And we try and bring them all together to answer a central question and it is the combined, um, it's the combined sort of, the combined inferences from all those different paths that lets us actually say something scientific about something cool and hard like this. It's why being a scientist could be so much fun and so right. cool. Right. And also why we need a huge and diverse team of scientists contributing, right? It's not like some person who's doing just the math for the sound waves, right? We need, we need people who know how to build 
instruments. We need people who know how to like do field work. We need people who can do math, computing, think of like new math and new ways to observe this incredibly rich data set and pick it apart. Like, right? Well, there's, uh, there's lots to do. I think that that leads really nicely into uh, our next question, which would be, you know, as a fluid dynamicist, you know, you probably are, maybe this is not the case for you, but to people like Tara and I, we look at fluid dynamics and think, wow, that is a very intimidating field. There's, it's, you know, it, that's, that's like you said, that's tons of math and physics and, and computation. Do you have any advice uh, or techniques for people uh, or students particularly that, that might be a bit scared to really dive into the subject? Someone who's curious and says, man, this sounds like a lot of cool stuff, but wow, that's terrifying. I'm terrified. What do you yeah. Think? Um, and, and like the math, the math and fluid dynamics looks really terrifying, especially because like combines vector calculus with other things. So you're like, you just look at the math and it's like, there's an upside down triangle and an X. What is even happening? Um, and like we often, we often, if we take things like calculus or vector calculus in college, um or or a little bit in high school or places like that we often like those are often like the highest level of math that we've learned in a traditional college uh degree um it's often very scary and you're like it's also very abstract like why are we even learning these things um then like pair that with like computers and like linear algebra was always linear algebra and matrices was always really scary for me it actually has taken till i've been a professor to stop being afraid of something as simple as linear algebra. Um, so it's not like even those of us who look like we know what we're doing, like sometimes we're still afraid of the math in spots. Um, I think the really neat thing with fluid dynamics though, is that you can start exploring and appreciating and experimenting in fluid dynamics without knowing the math. And you can do a lot of it in your own kitchen. Um, so, or other places, so we live in a fluid world, right? The atmosphere we live in is constant fluid dynamics. So every time you look up in the sky, um, many of the things that you're seeing are actually fluid phenomena. So like in Boulder, we often get um, patterns in the clouds. We get like these regular lines in the clouds where the clouds are all lined up one after the other, the other. That's often internal gravity waves fluid dynamic waves, internal gravity waves propagating in the atmosphere. The wind has come over the continental divide and that's kicked off these internal gravity waves and the ripples of the waves show up as clouds and spaces between the clouds and clouds and spaces between that ding, 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 ding. Whoa. Okay, and another cool. consequence of the fact that we live in Boulder, right at the edge of the mountains. Right at the edge of the mountains, and you have flow coming off the mountains and like hitting the Great Plains. It goes from this like it goes over the stair step basically, and like hits the Connell Divide. It kind of gives it a little kick, right? Wow. And we're like, we're in the the downstream direction where it's not like if you're if you're if you're still in the mountains, it's still getting all like stirred and churned up, and you know like downstream in Boulder and further east you're able to see the stuff kind of like playing itself out and not being churned up in the same sort of way. Um, summer thunderstorms, oh my gosh, like just sit and watch a thumber, summer thunderstorm at some point. There's a lot of really cool fluid dynamics going on in that. And sometimes you can actually even see it, like you can see like columns bursting. Um, if you get a chance to go up into like the near, um, like Flatirons, Chautauqua, um, we live up in Sunshine Canyon, so there's a great view from up there. Places where you can be a little up into the mountains, looking out over the plains. Um, during thunderstorm season, you can actually see the thunderstorms churning up and then like hitting and like forming a flat top at the top. That's actually, so the thunderstorms are convection, they're convective storms. And when they come up, they come up into what's called the stratosphere of the earth, which doesn't allow there to be convection. It's stably stratified. Stratosphere is the stratification. And as they hit that, they spread out and flatten. And that's actually convective overshoot and penetration, which is something we study in the deep interior of the sun. And you can just watch it unfolding with your eyes in the afternoons in Boulder. Um, okay, other fun things that anyone can do anywhere. Um, get a pot of water, get like a tall pot of water. Like you're gonna make like spaghetti in like, and like fill it, you know, a nice big pot of water. And like, 
metal, metal pot. I'm talking, you know, like a, a 12 quarter so, like nice big pot of wire. Now take a wooden spoon and just whack it on the side. You'll see all of these little tiny waves come up, but they only live right at the wall. They're called wall modes. And like, just, just play, take two spoons, hit, hit the thing with one spoon at different times. Uh, uh, so with waves, it helps if you hit things kind of in a, in a constant way. So like, ding, 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 that'll drive it at a particular frequency. Try hitting it at different speeds. Try hitting it with two spoons alternating, do stuff like that. And then um, once you've played with that a little bit in a pot, go look up, I think they're called um, dragon spitting bowls from China. They're these, um, so I got to see these at a um, CU Boulder Discovery Day. So like, this is where like, especially grad students set up like things that kids can come and see openly on campus. And I, of course, was bringing my kids to go and see like cool science. And um, a set of grad students from engineering had these dragon spitting bowls. And on those, you rub the bowl and it sets up these same wave patterns and they actually go nonlinear and they start spitting water out of the surface of the bowl. And they look like dragons spitting when you do them right. So like, you can see really cool fluid dynamics all around you all the time. Um, oh, one more favorite one. I really like drinking tea. I've got my cup of tea, which I, I have right here. I also tend to drink loose leaf tea and um, I always have the lees in my cup of tea because I, I always drink the end of the cup. Sometimes when you've got a cup of tea with lees in it, give it a little swirl, which I usually do when I'm like sitting here thinking anyways, right? And like, Swirl your tea and then like put it down. Then just like watch it. When you watch it, just on a time scale of like 30 seconds, you'll see all of the leaves which are on the bottom clump together in the center. It's super cool. You can do it bigger too. If you get like a like a glass quart mixing cup, you put some like tea leaves in it and let them sit and then like fill that up to like two or three cups, like not enough you're gonna slosh it out on your counter, but fill it up a little ways, put some like tea leaves in it, let them sink to the bottom, stir it and watch. You can watch now from the side, you can watch from the top and you'll see the leaves are kind of all distributed early on when all the fluid is moving. So it's important that it all move in the same way, right? So you're stirring it, you're not like, you're not like mixing it all up, you're, you're stirring it in a coherent way so it all swirls around in the same way, just like you do when you, like swirl your cup when you're just like thinking. Um, as that, there we go. So as that swirling motion stops, as the swirling comes to a rest, when it, when it kind of stops, you'll see the tea leaves again clump in the center. It's a phenomenon called Ekman pumping. It comes about in rotating fluid dynamical systems when you have a swirling flow against a surface like the bottom of the cup um, or the surface of our earth, or the surface of our ocean. And these swirling Ekman flows um, have all sorts of important implications. So if you look at the, the flow at the surface of the earth of the wind and the air going above it, sometimes you notice that like the clouds are going in one direction and the wind down at you is going another direction. And some of the difference between the winds aloft and the winds that you see are due to what's called an Ekman spiral, where the winds aloft change direction as they come down to where you are from the same physics that's happening as you swirl your cup and that causes the tea leaves to clump at the middle. It's called Ekman pumping and the Ekman spiral. And I think that playing with things like teacups and getting to really see stuff, that's what really helps me build my intuition and my love of fluid dynamics. Um, and that's then what helps me go and learn the math too. I'm like, wow, that's the thing I want to understand. What do I need to know to understand that? And it gives me that like, otherwise the math is just intimidating sometimes. That gives me the little like hook to be like, okay, like why do the tea leaves go to the center? Why not to the edges or other things like that? So. So it sounds like the takeaway could be, you know, find something that motivates your desire to learn the math so that you can then really grasp, you know, now you have this kind of subtle intuition, oh, well, these leaves are kind of coming up and, and kind of gathering right there. But in fact, there's a way to learn, you know, humans have figured out why that happens. And then you can, you know, now you're like, okay, well, now I, you know, I, every step of the way, I'm getting closer to saying, okay, this is, this is making sense in like a really technical way that is, you know, super kind of 
uh, kind of an intimate connection with what you're seeing. That's right. And, and like the only thing I'd emphasize on top of that is that like you can build this intuition in these just like lovely little in-between moments when you're doing something normal in your life anyways, like drinking your tea and you're like, I can't write that report anymore. I can't, I can't do one more homework. I can't like look at one more spreadsheet or whatever else. Oh, why do my tea leaves go to the center? What if I spin it faster? Does it take longer? What if I, what if I spin it the other way? Does the same thing happen if I spin it the other way? Like you can, it's all around us in our day-to-day -day lives because we live in this fluid world. It's not just something of like the core of the earth or the oceans or the center of the sun. And like your teacup can actually help you understand what's going on in our oceans. And that's cool. Uh, another fun place to go look at things. Um, what a, I, YouTube has some really great, uh, great sources to, to learn about these sorts of things. There's some really dedicated educators on YouTube. Um, three of my favorites, um, there's uh, Veritasium and I think uh, Better Every Day. They do some things together. Uh, two guys, one in Australia, one in, um, uh, he's, either, he's in the Southern US. Um, he's either in Alabama or, or in Texas. Are you Texas. talking about um, uh, Destin, Smarter Every Day? Smarter Every Day, yeah. yeah. So he has some great fluid, fluid dynamics videos. Smarter Every Day and the guy who does Veritasium, Veritasium's down in uh, Australia. Those two do some really cool fluid dynamics videos and even cooler do some like partnerships where like uh, there's, there's one that's going around right now where Smarter Every Day guys like laminar flows the best ever. And Veritasium guys like turbulent flows the best ever. And like they, they actually riff on each other and collaborate together to show both of them together. So those two top recommendation. The other top recommendation, a professor from um, University of California, Los Angeles, John Arnaud, Professor John Arnaud, he runs a group called the Spin Lab, Spin Lab UCLA, and they make just amazing YouTube videos where they, they, they're they really committed and dedicated to education outreach. They do a great job and just just great spot to go see, super cool stuff and learn from it. I show it in my, my graduate class in fluid dynamics all the time, but I also have my kids come and watch it. And like, and I show it to my wife. I'm like, look how cool this is. And like, it just, just beautifully created content that works at all levels. Those are those are three sources. Oh, let me give you a fourth. Um, uh, uh, FY Fluid Dynamics, uh, run by um, uh, Nicole, um, I think Barger, um, down in uh, in the Denver area. A blog post of um, super cool flu fluid dynamics, um, where she does extremely good descriptions of um, of what's going on. Um, so that's another one. Um, I'll try and send you the link to that so that you can post that. So that would be great. Well, thank you so much, Ben. You're a trove of information <laughs> that pretty much covered everything that we wanted to talk about. I did, though, want to ask you one question. So we do a little thing we call Capcom Q&A, where we solicit questions from the public and cool. trans bring those to our uh, experts here. And there was one that came through that I did want to ask you because I thought it was really interesting. So Dennis from Texas wants to know, why do more sunspots let me hear radio stations from far away, but solar flares Ooh. disrupt my listening? Ooh. This is something I've never Ooh. heard of before. So I'm really interested in this. And this was from Dennis. Is that yeah. um, So Dennis, this is a cool question. And it's actually on some fundamental level why we learned to love studying the sun at all, to study solar physics at all. So um, let me answer your question and then let me tell you a cool little bit of history because I'm a professor, so I talk all the time. Okay, so um, so to answer your question, so there's a good chance that your far away radio um, signals that you're seeing are probably coming off of, um, bouncing off the ionosphere of the earth. Okay, so the ionosphere is this layer of our atmosphere way high up that's a, a charged layer and if you're down here on the surface and you send radio waves up, they hit this charged layer and it can act to reflect them and it can bounce them down. Um, okay, so, so we can use that to communicate long distances. Um, uh, AM radio does that and so do some of the um, like hobbyist radio sorts of things like camera radio and other stuff. This is how you can like get signals from like Antarctica to, um, to Colorado and do stuff like that too, right? So you basically, you bounce signals off the ionosphere or channel them in parts of the atmosphere up near the ionosphere. Um, 
I don't know why sunspots make it easier to see better, um, but it's got to do with properties out of the ionosphere. And I have some ideas of what solar flares do. So when a solar flare goes off, so a solar flare is a just sudden release of a whole bunch of extremely energetic photons, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet comes streaming out of the sun all at once. Uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a bunch of great experts in Boulder for um, learning about flare physics. These are just crazy things. Um, Professor Adam Kowalski in the APS department and in uh, the National Solar Observatory is a great person for this stuff to, to learn more about. So when those, um, so, so are some other people in Boulder. Boulder's a, a real center for trying to understand this stuff. When that um, pulse of like crazy energetic photons flies through space and hits the Earth's atmosphere, um, it does all sorts of things to ionosphere um, and it changes the, the charge states and it like um, changes the, the surface shapes of the ionosphere. It could be pushing it deeper in, it could be blowing parts of it off. I don't know, these are not things that, that I'm the right person to ask about, but I know that flares like mess up the ionosphere of the earth. And when that, so do coronal mass ejections that can be associated with them and like, they do cool stuff to the uh, the upper layers. I think that what's happening is these storms, this this nice layer that you're using to channel and bounce your radio waves off of, it's just being all messed up, and you can't get your signals from long distances anymore during these flare events. Okay, um, I promised you a cool bit of history. So, um, so the first time we started really noticing this in kind of a big way, the fact that events from the sun could um, affect things on the earth it was during world war ii and it's when we were doing long distance uh, radio communications and radar and over the horizon communications and stuff like this and um I, i'm not a historian my loose sense of this um dolores nip who i think is uh in the engineering department of cu in part be a really good person to ask some of these questions of she's she's got a really cool um she's got a couple really cool videos on some of this stuff um and was practiced a lot in solar in space weather in with a lot of expertise. But my my layman's history for you. Um, we started doing a lot of long distance communications, and sometimes we noticed that like our communications would just like completely fuzz out, and like we wouldn't be able to like communicate with like the bomber group or the forward observers or whatever else. We were like, oh man, our enemies like the the Germans and the Japanese. They've got these like amazing technologies, and they're like. They're stopping our radio communications and other stuff. What are they doing? We learned partway through that it was actually solar storms, solar flares that were doing it. That, that like when the disruptions happened correlated with solar patterns rather than with like some like amazing super weapon. Um, and in fact, shortly after World War II is when the high altitude observatory was established in Colorado, in Climax, Colorado initially. Uh, but then eventually moved down to Boulder. High Altitude Observatory HAO is still in Boulder, Colorado. And um, to my, again, layman's understanding is one of the reasons we now have a National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Um, HAO actually got its start just up behind the Fisk Planetarium where we, um, where we have uh, uh, Collins backdrop right now. Um, up near Summers Bosch Observatory is where HAO had its on-campus presence for a long time before it moved off campus. Um, so, um, these disruptions of radio are one that we, we started studying solar physics in detail, not just because the sun was cool, but it, in real detail in this nation with significant investments in the 1950s, because we understood at that point that it had both civilian and military implications in a like obvious, like day-to-day -day operational, like we have to figure this out. And to this day, the Air Force continues to study, um, solar space weather um, forecasting and, um, and trying to understand how things get disrupted. Um, these space weather events disrupt things like civilian aircraft. Um, so especially transcontinental flights are affected by these. Um, they affect GPS, which affects everything from navigation to things like tethering of oil platforms out in the Gulf of Mexico and places like that. Um, these, uh, these space weather, um, space weather 
is a uh, is a uh, like trillion dollar insurance industry, and like it's something that's a uh, that's a huge thing for our technological society. So long distance communications, satellites, flights, all of these sorts of things are affected by space, whether in a profound way. I think you're seeing it in a in a local reflection in your long distance radio communications. Very cool. Well, um, I think that we are just about out of time. So uh, we have been uh, talking with uh, Dr. Ben Brown, a fluid dynamicist and uh, assistant professor at CU Boulder. Ben, thanks so much for, for being with us today. Absolutely. And um, you can find me online through my faculty contacts. You're welcome to send me emails from the public as questions come up. Um, I don't promise to respond to them in any timely fashion. Um, I have three small children who I love very much um, and do a couple of other things too. Um, but uh, I will try and respond to questions that come if people want to ask questions or point people to other people who can actually answer those questions. <laughs>